Okay. So when people found out like, oh, hey, there's this thing called Title 42. I think it's Title 42. I don't want to speak. I think it is. But let's just use that for reference. Say, oh, the Title 42, this is what it means, right? And so they're like, oh, shit, let's go. Boom. So the big influx you saw at the border is because they knew that there was a different policy in place. And that policy meant that they would be more lenient on them. So like, let's give it a shot. Boom. Huge influx of immigration. Border, trays and border patrol stations are not built to take on more than a certain amount, which is very low, maybe 25 people. Uh, and so you get over hundreds and thousands and thousands of people like, well, how do you fix that? There's, no, there's nothing in the system that tells them how to manage that besides pack, package them up and hand them off to ICE to do whatever they need to do with them, right? How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually, it could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. What's going on, everybody? I hope that you enjoyed season one of Change Agents which is an ironclad original. Worry not, we are working on season two right now. And in between season one and season two, we have some special episodes for you. As you may have noticed, the format of the interviews are carefully edited. They're hyper-focused on the guest, the problems that they face or the issue that they are trying to tackle, and of course, their solutions. Having said that, there's, of course, some footage, some content that hits the editing room floor, where we did not want to miss an opportunity to share a few of those extended interviews with some of our favorite conversations from season one. So today, please enjoy this extended interview with Vincent Vargas. See, Mark. Oh, I didn't see that camera. There might be more that you don't see. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm looking. Why do you guys say action? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not acting. I'm not a fucking light switch, Jesse. All right? We'll say rolling. How's that? Perfect. When you were growing up, is this what you wanted to do? Working in the entertainment industry? Uh, you know, there was thoughts of it. There's definitely thoughts of it. There's, there's, you know, you see people in the, kind of in the community that do it, and so... It's always, I think Mighty Ducks too was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. But uh, that is a reference that <laughs> not a lot of people are gonna get. <laughs> they bet, they, I, bet, I bet more will, I bet more will than you'd think. I wonder if we can track the streaming of Mighty Ducks 2 after this. That would be an interesting <laughs> metric to see the actual value proposition of a show. <laughs> Obscure titles, Jesus. Oh man, I forget how crazy this city, town, I don't know the difference between a city or a town, is until I come back here. Yeah. I, I lived down the road in San Diego in East Lake for probably about 10 years and uh, moved to a place that was so much smaller. And even just on the short Uber, I'm staying in a hotel, you can see just off your right shoulder. And just the short Uber drive here, dude, I, I forget how incredibly familiar it used to be. The yeah. compressed nature and honestly, like the abject poverty fucking everywhere. Yeah, yeah man. Um, dude, I grew up in the, in the valley, which is not the direct representation of what LA is, but there's a hint of it still. And bringing my wife to come visit, she was like, I thought LA was gonna be prettier. <laughs> there are places in LA that are gorgeous. Definitely, yes. There are places in LA that are worse than the countries that you and I deployed to. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. not that bad, but it's pretty close. <laughs> pretty close, <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty close, definitely. Yeah, I yeah. don't know if there's been an RPG incident on the streets of LA yet, so we should be okay. I think there was a tank at one point. I think there was a tank. <laughs> I know there was in Colorado. Have you ever watched the documentary of the guy who built his own tank up there? No. He went big. <laughs> it's kind of a how-to manual of how to just fuck up a town. Yeah. I forget how they actually got him out of there. He, he definitely did not live. Yeah. But I think, I think they gassed him. 
<laughs> this is the home of the original active shooter, right? The North Hollywood shooter. Oh shit, I forgot about that. Where did that occur in LA? North Hollywood. Okay, where are we? Kind of, uh, so we're, we are... we're kind of downtown LA, and so I would say more kind of that area. Uh, it's gonna be uh, the five slash, uh, I think it's kind of 101-ish. You'd have to get towards, closer towards Burbank or, or Valley Glen area where like, we're like uh, yeah, it's just North Hollywood, man. It's, uh, it was Banks, right? It was Bank of America. Holy shit, what year was that? It's probably 2000-ish, I think it's, oh, actually, because I remember I applied for the Sears across the street and I never went, to, I never showed up to work. Um, it was 98, I believe it was. That's, that's the original, you know, remember during that they were fully armored and law enforcement didn't have the proper kind of guns to, to penetrate that. So they went to a local gun store. I was just going to say that if you hadn't said that, they were going into the gun store like, yeah. hey, hook a brother up. And it's kind of changed the, you know, subject, the, the whole, I guess, the SOP for For how, sure. Because that was like the first time, like, holy smokes. How long has it been since you've watched the footage of that? Uh, I think I watched it about two years ago again, just because it's... Seeing the rounds yes. skip off of their soft armor? Dude, it's super wild, man. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know what I was watching at the time, because I, I was fascinated with it for a little bit. Yeah. Mostly because I do remember it happened. It had to have happened pre-9-11, because I'm like, holy shit, dude. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's a gunfight, and like, plain view, the cops are getting worked, and yeah. these dudes are basically demonstrating why violence of action yeah, it was, is an amazing tactic. It was Call of Duty with that juggernaut suit, right? <laughs> Before Call of Duty. But then I remember, like, like what's that skipping off yeah. the person's body? Like, those are bullets. Dude, it's crazy to think at that time it was nothing was like that, and that's kind of, you know, that's the, the first version of what now, you know, we see a lot of. I mean, the modern day cops, I think, would have uh, mopped up that problem a little bit easier. Oh, absolutely. Probably given the fact that they actually have carbines now as opposed to yeah. just... And snipers that are yeah, yeah, super yeah. Dope. I don't know how the hell we got ended up talking on this. <laughs> don't know, but we're in LA. <laughs> we are in LA. So born and raised in LA. Um, I, I know we'll end up talking about the border later on, and then I, I think it's a fascinating tie to how much work you do or have done at the border, given how your family came to the yep. U.S. But before that, you know, your military service led you to working with the border patrol. Given that you are, what was you, your second generation? Second generation. Was, was your, were your parents in the military at all or were you the first my, person to raise your right hand? Uh, like, I mean, it goes back to like my great grandfather serving at some point, right? Um, yeah. But my father was a Marine for a short stint. You know, he did his, he did a three year contract. Um, and I think he did something on the flight line, flight deck or something to that, to that nature. But uh, it wasn't like the family thing to follow. It was more like, life kind of pivoted and I needed direction. I needed something to do. It was yeah. a, you know, I was trying to do the whole college baseball thing and it didn't work out. I had a daughter uh, and it was kind of like, okay, well, how do I, how do I kind of be a better father for her and provide? Uh, and as well as like watching it on TV, uh, you know, I've told the story, I just watched, I was watching a Marine put the flag over the Saddam statue and rip it down. And that was pretty iconic for me at that time. I was 20, you know, 23 years old and like, Super dope to be able to experience something like that. You know what I mean? And 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 I don't want to I don't want to miss something like that because I'm focusing on baseball, which doesn't exist anymore for me. So there's nothing else for me to do than to serve. And if I die, then my daughter gets that four hundred thousand or whatever it was at the time. And you know, and she has a father who served a country, you know, and died in. That's kind of like the thought process. And um, and so I joined, man. And I joined with that option forty contract and just to see what it was about. How close did you get to the college baseball trajectory path that you were on? You know, I started, uh, I went to junior college first. I went to a Valley Community College. I got in trouble there for some dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> went to Glendale Community College and, you know, I had a good run. I was a kind of a middle relief closer, second, second string closer, because we had one of the best closers at the time. Um, and we went to the Junior College World Series, man. It was, a, it was a fucking blast. It was probably like some of the most exciting baseball I've ever been, been a part of. Uh, and then that summer I traveled with a... Uh, like an all Japanese baseball team and kind of did the Midwest tour of like Kentucky, uh, Indiana, several places and kept the kind of keep the dream alive. Academic issues, I went up north and played a summer in Chico, boom, got me a full ride to an NAIA college in, in, in Kentucky. Uh, and as I was having a great preseason, uh, I never even got to play because I became academically ineligible. Your athletic career is very similar to my own. My strategy in high school, which is the limit of my higher education, was uh, academic probation, 
slightly off. <laughs> Academic probation, slightly off. Yeah. I just kept it on the rails enough. My dad would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. I, like, I, I don't care, but I love baseball and water polo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much. I, uh, you know, I did enough to get, to get the 2.0 to play. Yeah. And then when it wasn't baseball season, I it was in summer school every year, you know what I mean? Or winter school, whatever it was. And uh, it continued, you know, I had a, I had a reading dis disability, you know, I was dyslexic, didn't know that it was like, no one said anything about it. I just thought I couldn't read. And, uh, you know, that kind of carried on. Like the insecurities of reading was just like, I, I was just going to avoid everything as possible and just try and guess. And so I never really uh, focused on schooling. And so eventually it caught up to me. I don't know if I've ever asked anybody this. From, it comes from uh, dyslexia. Do the, weird, do the words and letters just appear jumbled or is it a processing issue in the brain? Uh, I feel like, it, so it's a process, it has to be processing. So I've never thought about exactly what happens, but I know there is times where I feel like if you give me too many numbers on a paper, I do feel like they kind of, they kind of wiggle a little. So I have to really focus on like what the number pattern is. Yeah. But reading, I see these, like my brain tells me it's a different word and I can believe it. So like, uh, <laughs> There's this coconut grill in freaking Utah that's opening up, and I call it the knockout grill. My wife's like, what the hell? And I'm like, oh my God, it's not knockout. I saw knockout. It says knockout in my head until I looked at it and was like, oh my God, if I spell out each letter at a time, it's nowhere near that. But somehow my, my mind flipped it on me, and it looked, I, I was convinced. I said, knockout grill, it must be a boxing grill. I love boxing, and so like, I was so convinced to it. But this happens all the time. There's this quote that says, it says, dyslexics, of the world untie, but I read unite. And my That's wife, fucked up yeah. that somebody would make a sign like that. <laughs> yeah, and my sister, <laughs> we were at a sandwich shop when I was younger and she goes, Vince, read it. And I read it and I said, unite. And she goes, oh my God. And I was like, what? It says untie. And you just it just flipped the word for me. That is such high level fuckery. I'm so <laughs> appreciative of the person that made that sign. Cause it's obviously targeted at people yes. who aren't gonna get the joke. <laughs> Yeah, because I was like, cool, Unite, man, we're, we're oh in this together, god. and everyone else gets the joke. Oh my Fuck. god. Yeah. All right, so you actually, so you, before you joined, you were watching images of what was going on in Iraq. Yeah, man, you know what pretty interesting happened? You know, 9-11 happened, and it was a really beautiful time in, in California, if you will, that... I, it, I was in San Diego at the time, too. I would it, describe it exactly the same way. It was just, everyone was so cool, and it was like, we were doing these parades on the street of just pride of America. Remember the overpasses? Yes. In flags yeah, same. And, we yeah. did that on Ventura Boulevard. Our, almost our whole baseball team was there. We're cheering. And it was just a really beautiful, like, patriotic time that I've never felt in my life. You know, I was too young to really uh, acknowledge the whole Desert Storm era. But this was like, man, this feels different. There's something going on. And that buzz was exciting, but baseball was still the priority. Um, and, and, you know, I slowly kind of watched things. And I kind of also put it behind my head because I felt... I kind of felt guilty that I wasn't right away like, go, go serve. Because part of me felt I should. The other part was like, but well, I got something going here. I really believe this baseball thing is going to work for me. Um, so let's just stay that path, you know? And in the back of my head, it was always like, God, I feel like I should be doing this. Like, I should serve. Um, as I got into Kentucky, you know, my, my nights were filled with just kind of going to like a Buffalo Wild Wings and drinking beer. And there's nothing other than the news on. And so I started to watch some of the, some of the shots and... And I got really interested. I started watching the whole uh, Band of Brothers, you know, series. And Powerful. Then, holy smokes. If, you know, if I could relate anything to the camaraderie of baseball, it would be the camaraderie I see on film and, and military movies. You know, and, and it's very similar. It's hard to explain how that's similar. It's, it's not, but it is. Uh, and then, you know, Black Hawk Down. And that's where I was like, dude, Rangers are kind of cool. That's a cool, that's a cool community of dudes. And um, that just, you know, I went to the recruiter just because I was like, you know, everything fell apart and I was like, well, let's go, you know? I actually went to uh, a Navy SEAL recruiter, second to the Marine recruiter. I went to the Marine recruiter first. I don't tell this to, it's funny. My dad was like, I went to the Marine recruiter. I said, hey, what's your bonus? Because I heard there's bonuses. And he goes, the bonus is being a Marine. I'm like, fuck this, I'm out. <laughs> Talking about a check, <laughs> asshole. Yeah, my, my dad's like, don't be a Marine. I was like, all right, cool. Because I didn't like what they got, the, his attitude was like whack for me. And cool, Marines are like, that's a Marine thing, right? Yeah. Then I went to the Navy, dude, and I was like, well, Navy SEALs, I heard, are pretty cool, you know? And the guy's like, well, I can make you, I can help you get an underwater um, welding job, but you can try out for buds. I'm like, no, 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 dude, you don't get it. I want to know. And I didn't know if there was a thing. I don't know if there's, like, contract buds. I don't know, but I know, like, I wanted to see that. Yeah. I didn't want, I was old enough to know, like, you're not going to fuck with me here, recruiter. Like, I want the real deal. And David showed up to Texas Roadhouse where I worked. like, look, we can make it happen. I'm like, too late. The fucking Army recruiter got me an Army Ranger contract. You know what I mean? It was kind of like... I'm old enough to know like I won't get fucked around 
and I'm getting exactly what I want, or I'm not going. I don't need it, you know? Um, the Army gave me a $20,000 signing bonus. It's awesome. I was like, it was 19, I think it was, but still, it was like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm down. My daughter gets more money. Cool. Um, it was kind of a pain in the ass to receive all that money eventually because there's all these hoops and fucking ladders they put you through. But yeah, man, so I got the Option 40 contract Ranger. Genuinely thought I was the only one. Like, I'm like the special guy. <laughs> <laughs> Show up to basic training and everyone in there has an option 40 contract. I was going like, to say, you might have been the only one that day. <laughs> yeah, man. I thought, you was fucked up, dude. I, I was an athlete my whole life. And I remember the first outing with all these recruiters. And I'm like, these, these military dudes are going to be athletes. And we played volleyball. And it was like, I was like, dude, they're not athletes. They're fucking terrible at sports. And I almost wanted to walk away because I'm like, there's no way, dude. I can't show up to the military with a bunch of dudes who can't play sports. Because I, I, for some reason, I correlated this athleticism to like really good soldiering. I mean, we should be careful correlating volleyball and sport. <laughs> dude, I was good at volleyball, bro. You know, yeah. <laughs> you might have been good at volleyball. I mean, every time people bring up volleyball in the military, I just go right back to Top Gun in the 80s. <laughs> Fucking yes. dog tags and taped wrists. Like, what? Do you, why do you need to tape your wrists? What kind of is that? A bowling ball? You guys are hitting back and forth. It's it's, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it is gorgeous. And naval aviation recruiting went on a, like an orbit trajectory right after that, which is exactly why they agreed to support Maverick. I'm sure That's it's so funny. Doing exactly the same thing. No, the stories that were told from military recruiters. I always just tell people, like, listen. At the end of the day, much like a car salesman, yeah. they might be a great person. It's a numbers game. Yes. And just realize that their job is to get you from here to here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, eventually in my career, I became a, a drill sergeant, and I was cursing every damn fucking recruiter there was, dude. Oh, like, I bet. Yeah, they're trying to fill seats. <laughs> I'm like, how, how the hell did we get you in here, man? That Jeez. had to have been like your Twilight tour on your way out. Uh, so it was kind of different for us. So like after I did the four years with, uh, you know, with Ranger Battalion, uh, I decided to get out, but I kind of went straight into the reserves, just kind of keep. keep. Oh, okay. It was like keep the uh, keep the insurance thing going for the family, you know. And and there was a little bit of another bonus. I was thinking it was like 10k or something like that. But um, you know, I was kind of wanting to do something that I know would keep me home more, that was non-deployable because like it was just one after the other in random time. Yeah. And so the only thing was recruiting or drill sergeant. And so I, I was like, I'll do drill sergeant. That's fine. Um, and once I got through that training. Shit, I didn't get activated for another three years. And then all of a sudden, when I did, it was a cool time, man. It was kind of like I missed being activated. Got activated. You're training young soldiers to, to get prepared for war. And you're, you know, I'm already raising kids as a father. It's almost like raising kids in the, in the, in the military. Um, and so I kind of took it for what it was. It was a really beautiful time in my career. I think it was probably the most rewarding time. You know, if you've ever been a cadre member or instructor, it's just really cool. It's a kind of a cool position to be in, especially if you use it in the right way and not just a dick, you know? And uh, it was cool. That was like my favorite time of my career as in like rewarding. It's interesting you say that. So I joined in 96, obviously 9-11, 2001. So I got a really good chunk of time pre-9-11 in the SEAL community. And it was, I mean, it was everything I thought it was going to be. <laughs> we lifted weights every day and then got shit-faced. It was the best life <laughs> I could ever possibly imagine for myself. Surrounded by awesome people, yeah. by and large. Obviously, there were some outliers that, <clears throat> we'll leave it at that. They were outliers. Post 9-11, you know, went out to the East Coast, got to go to a command that I wanted to be at and operate at a super high level and end up getting hurt on a target. And my rehab from that is I went back and I was a BUDS instructor from oh, cool. mid-2006 until 2008. And then went back to a West Coast team, deployed again in 2010, got out in 2013. I look back at my whole career, that instructor tour is actually the most rewarding tour out of everything that I had done. Yeah. It, I didn't want to go there when I first, my options, I don't, actually don't even remember what the options were when I was looking at places that I could go. I selected that one because I had familiarity. It was California. I right. was born and raised from California, familiarity. I had come from a West Coast team. And I actually, I don't remember what I was expecting, but I just couldn't fathom being satisfied in an instructor role in the middle of a time period with serious kinetic activity going right. on. And I look back at it, fuck, it was Awesome. Yeah. I got to actually, in the metaphor, I use, like you can put your hands into the clay of the community and mold it into a direction that actually will have long lasting impact. Right. Or, like you were saying, people who have a chip on their shoulder and they go the other direction and then you get cold cocked in a bar. Yes. And nobody wants to work <laughs> with you. Yeah, yeah, that's the exactly. So you had people that 
You know how it is, dude. They get their hat and their badge, and it's just their identity for the rest of their life. And they have a license plate that says push private and all these weird shit. And those dudes are sad, man, because... Is there they, actually somebody who has that as a I, license plate? There, <laughs> there is. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Uh, but, you know, when God. that becomes the identity, that's... That's the wrong direction, right? That's not yeah. the guy, right? Because that guy is is holding onto that title way too hard, right? For me, it was just like, dude, I'm excited to be in this position to hopefully, you know, help guide these dudes and, and mentor them into a place where I think it would be valuable, you know, and, and give all my experience to them. And so, but dude, that's, like, I have so many still soldiers that reach out to me because I did it for a year straight. I was activated and still have a lot of people reach out. I'm like, man, really appreciate how you did that. And I, you know what's funny? I called my drill sergeant today. I said, bro, I want to tell you. He's like, bro, your, your success. And I'm like, no, no, no there's a big part of why I'm successful from what you instilled in me as a, as a private. And, and I'll never forget that. You know what I mean? But like, cause I've gotten those calls from my own soldiers. I was like, dude, let me tell my own drills. I called him today on the way over here. It was kind of funny. But like, you know, that guy was an inspiration to me. He was, a, he was a hard ass. He was, he was experienced. He was a ranger tabbed. You know, he, he, he was just what, like, I was like, this is a cool dude that like, I want to emulate as I get older. And eventually, you know, I went and did the same kind of things he did. And it was kind of cool, but you know, I didn't have that until I got to the military. I didn't have someone, like, my dad wasn't a combat dude. My dad was was a support element, which is cool, but it, it was just with my position, my drill sergeant really was the dude at the time. Until I got to Ranger Town, then I found other dudes to kind of emulate and look up to. And so, and I became that for others, too, which is fucking dope. And, and you know, I've, I've always appreciated that time as a drill sergeant. How was your path from in the military into Ranger battalion and then your first deployment overseas. I feel like it was pretty quick during those time periods. Dude, it was nuts, man. We went from basic training to airborne, uh, no day off. It was the day of in processing. You graduated and you kind of, you headed straight over. Where was your basic training? It was in, it was in Fort Benning. Oh shit, so yeah. you was the same base. In infantry, dude, yeah, right? Okay. So infantry in the army is Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, if you're infantry active duty, there's other weird things, but infantry active duty, Fort Benning, Georgia, no matter what. So I'm at Delta 258, I think it's Sand Hill, whatever they yeah. call it. Graduate, you, you, your family takes you to airborne to in process, right? Like you hug them, you're like, oh, I love yeah. you, thank you, I'm so happy. Take all these moto photos, and then you head straight over to airborne. You in process, and then they let you go on for the night so you can have dinner with your family. But then the, the next Monday, boom, you start out there on the cables at goddamn yeah. static line jump school. Right, and it's like, it's kind of a cool thing because you you go from this kind of like total control environment to like now you're kind of a big big army but you're still in a school environment, so it's, it's this really cool transition. They let you go drink every weekend so you can go fuck your home life up if you needed to, if you yep. wanted to. But you know, I, I was like, I need to keep going in a good path because I've, I've already done all this dumb shit. I've gotten in trouble already, so like, let's just stay right and try and get straight to Ranger Battalion. So the day you graduate Airborne, you pack all your shit, you put it all in the fucking cables, and then Rip Cadre comes and picks you up, carry all your shit, head over to fucking Rip, and you're like, Dude, I've not no fucking days off with this shit. So straight to rip. We in process on a Friday. They gave us the weekend off. Boom, started started Monday. Graduated from that. I think it's a three week course. I almost failed because uh, my reading. I failed the Ranger history history exam uh, by two points. Called my mom and said, I might not make it, mom. She's like, Oh, Vinny, just try. Like I'm gonna. You know me, but shit, I can't read this thing for nothing. I know nothing about the Ranger history. Luckily, passed by one fucking point, dude. Graduate, rip, <laughs> go to fucking, uh, it's, it's, it's like in processing in Fort Lewis. Uh, within the six days, we already had a, rip, a ranger captain come over and say, hey, get your DCUs, because we're going on the reach back, bird. We're like, okay. Got our DCUs, got them all sewn up, showed up. The whole Pat Tillman incident happening and at the same time. They decided not to give us on the reach back, bird, and just wait for them to come back to us. They got back to us within 30, 45 days, boom, we're redeployed to Afghanistan. I forgot that Tillman was at one of the battalions that is up in the- uh, Second Ranger Battalion. Yeah, that was my, that was our battalion. He was actually my company. He was uh, in second platoon, I was in first. But how, yeah, I never met him. I actually knew him pretty well. Did you? Yeah, I met him on our first deployment to Iraq. Uh, I, was, I was there when they walked his casket to the uh, aircraft in uh, Bagram, his brother, Kevin. Yep, Kevin. Who I've stayed close friends with. He actually came up and spent about 10 days with us in Montana. We had, forget what we had come back from. We had just come back from executing a target somewhere and the internet was down. I'm like, this is weird. Somebody either super high ranking right. has Someone. been killed mm -hmm. or something else happened. And we walked into the, the talk and Kevin was there just fucking destroyed. And I just remember giving him a hug and... Uh, yeah, and like fleeting memories of Tillman's casket being walked out to the aircraft. 
How quickly did they start talking about the blue on blue aspect of that inside of the battalion? Dude, imagine being like the new guy. We were like the last to know the truth of anything. It was kind of like, shut the fuck up, go guard the gate. It's some news guy, you don't talk to him, nothing. We're like, okay, and then I'm on CQ. The call was like, hey, is there a nice guy? I was like, no, ma'am, sorry, this time we got, you know, this whole thing we have yeah, to read. Script. It, yeah, and hang it up, right? Um, and so we were hearing these things, right? And people were coming back, guys who got injured on that same op, right? Yeah. Like a couple a couple other dudes got, got hit. I don't know, friend, I never understood the whole story because it actually kind of turned into like a, like a, almost like a gag order or something. Like no one really wanted to talk about it. Even guys that I became good friends with, still very, very little was ever said about it all. Um, at one point I did pick up Kevin with another another new guy and we took him to go eat and we had to take him somewhere. It was like he was out processing his essentially yeah. what it was. And they had us just with him because you know, at one moment he was super pissed and talking mad shit to them, rightfully fucking so. And then so they kind of had us kind of cater him around as he was out processing some yeah. shit. So for us new, we were just kind of trying to stay out of the way, and, but we already caught the buzz. And then you see the news. So when it first got to us, you already heard like, um, you know, Pat Tim was killed. And this is, this is like, almost like before I process, it's kind of happening. And we're like, oh my God. And then you hear, I think within a week of us being there, it was like possible friendly fire. And you're just like, Jesus, dude. You know, like what the fuck? Yeah. And uh, and then just kind of to see how it was kind of chaotic for a moment, you know, as people came back, you knew they were properly involved. Then they packed their stuff and got shipped out, right? RFS, like a, a, the whole truck got RFS. Super bizarre way that it was handled. I think they knew almost instantly that it was, uh, you guys would probably call it a green on green. We called it blue on blue. Right. I think they knew almost instantly what it was. I think we call it blue on blue as well, if I remember correctly, but super odd. Like I, the more I learned about it, it was from books that were written about it because it was yeah. interesting to me. I was like, dude, I got to see what the hell. And yeah, man, you know, the, the one thing that bothers me is that people say like, it was intentional. They knew it was Pat and they killed. Like, no, 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 that's not how that works, right? Like At I all. really, yeah. it, I, I don't think nothing like that. I think genuinely uh, lack of experience, fear, uh, and lack of control in the battlefield is what happened. That's- It's the same shit, I, I see this one online where extortion 17 yeah. was payback and uh, Biden, no, I'm sorry, not Biden, Obama somehow was in cahoots with the Taliban and told them where they were gonna be <laughs> right. because that's the same unit that killed bin Laden. It's like, listen, you fucking idiots. <laughs> like, do yeah, you that's... have any idea how galactically impossible what you're saying is? Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I just think yeah. it's the uncertainties of combat. It's uh, a lot of things that happen. And in the Pat Tillman scenario, I think it was just a, a lack of control on, on a battlefield and fear took over instead of control. I think the mistake that they made was just not being honest. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I know people think that warfare is, it's black and white. And in my experience, that hasn't been the case. And mistakes fucking happen. Yep. Innocent people get killed on target. It happens. Do bad guys get killed on targets and gals too? Absolutely. I've been there and I've watched children get vaporized from bre breaching charges. They didn't yep. do anything other than hear something and approach a door as the breacher was getting ready to clock the charge yep. off. I have seen people get shot who, in the greater, grander scheme of things, probably didn't deserve it. Yep. The worst thing you can do in that environment is just not tell the truth. And I, you know, I've heard people say, especially when it comes to blue on blues, especially when it comes to blue on blues that have an essence of, let's give this guy a really high military award and paint him under the mm. image of being a hero and talk about that as opposed to what happens for protection of the family. Yeah. It doesn't protect the family. No. You know, I, what protects the family and I think the integrity of the military is telling the truth. Like it doesn't change, like Tillman, to even get to that place in Afghanistan, to give up what he gave up, to yes. walk away from what he had, for him and his brother to join together as a team to mm -hmm. make it to that point, being killed by another American soldier doesn't fucking change who Pat Tillman was or what he stood for or what it is that he was trying to do. Absolutely. Lying about it does. Yep. And it cheapens the entire military experience and it cheapens everything that the military is supposed to Stand for it, in my opinion. I agree. At least they need to tell the fucking truth. I agree. I think they were caught in a, with their dick in their hand and like, how do we save ourselves on this? 
And there was no saving it, man. This is yeah. the, the truth was the truth, and it was unfortunate as fuck. So then when did you uh, first deploy uh, with Rangers? Uh, I think it was sometime like October or something in 2004. Afghanistan or Iraq? Yeah, Afghanistan. We, you know, we, we staged out of Bagram, and then, you know, we would run some ops out of Salerno and just go all around wherever the mission took us, you know? Yeah. Um, was it what you thought it was going to be? You know, my first, the first deployment was pretty, pretty slow in the sense. It was kind of like, man, it's just, it wasn't, it was a lot of like, kind of like air ops, like just going through the objectives, walking them in. Um, and it felt like, I guess thinking of it now, it probably was more on the fence of like there was not enough intel to drive more missions. So searching for intel, searching for follow on missions and stuff like that. Yeah. As I got to Iraq in 2005, it felt like maybe the intel has stepped it up or some kind of new use of, of things that were able to, to generate more traffic. Because then it was like boom, 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 boom. Um, and Iraq was different, right? So Afghanistan was kind of like this very poor, desolate spaces where we were, we weren't like- Especially big, up in like Salerno, right. up in Kaust, I right. mean, Jesus. Yeah, so like, you know, you're hitting these objectives with these people that's probably never never seen a chem light in years or whatever the case, right? This yeah. really, really, really interesting things where you know, were definitely the foreigner in the space. And um, that was interesting because I felt like they were almost intimidated just by our look, right? The the green eyes, you know, that you heard that our green eyes were glowing to them or whatever yeah. the case. Well, if a UFO landed out in the park, I would probably be a little bit worried about what people were wearing yeah. stepping off of it as well. Right, absolutely. And so that was probably the interesting thing for me is like just kind of stepping back and looking at it. I was like, man, this is wild, you know? Um, and again, we didn't have a lot of, uh, we didn't have too many ops on the first deployment that I was on. We came back uh, and then instead of going to ranger school, I opted to go to, to another deployment because I heard it was Iraq. I'm like, well, I don't want to miss Iraq, so let's go. When we went to Iraq, that's kind of when like, it seems like our intel and, and intel-driven missions were like popping and popping, you know? Where'd they stage you? We were out of Mosul. Okay. Yeah. I think it was more an issue of people were now coming into Iraq. I mean, you, you gotta think about it, right? When, whatever you believe, people can believe whatever they want anywhere in the world, like go live your life. Yeah. If you're an X person and there are Y people and you wanna fight and you're one of those people that's willing to do so, you're gonna go where the other people are. Yeah. Iraq, Mosul specifically, like it's just easier to get into that country and find your jihad than it yeah. is Afghanistan. No, absolutely. We were, we were, you know, we were snatching up dudes that were coming from Syria and they just wanted to get revenge on whatever, yeah. on US, you know, and so we were getting- Or sharpen their fighting skills. Right. If, you want, if you want to experience warfare, you have to go where the war is. Yeah, we had a lot of people that weren't even Iraqi that were just trying to fight us because they wanted to, they wanted to bring yeah. the fight to the Westerners, right? And we had- dude threw hand grenades and in the end of it, it was just like, yeah, I just want to try and get a couple of you guys. And you're like, what, what the hell going on here? You know what I mean? It had nothing to do with the city, nothing to do with like, you know, it was just, uh, he wanted to take out Westerners and it was just kind of odd, man. And, and, and again, those things, like, I wasn't, I wasn't this machine that, that some people turn into. I wasn't just like, go straight to go straight. I really was always like, man, this is all very odd to me, right? Everything we do is interesting, you know what I mean? Um, I was, I was in the perspective of like, I know they're fighting a war they believe in, but we're fighting a war I believe in. And it's so like, do I even believe in it? I don't know, right? I'm really just needed money for my kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then now that I'm here, I'm just a competitive athlete. And so I want to do good. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, and I, and Stakes I love, are a little bit higher. Right. And I love the dudes to the left and right of me. So I'm willing to die for these dudes because like, fuck it, right? Like, why not? But, but it wasn't like I understand, I understood politically why we were doing anything. And I didn't fucking care, dude. I was genuinely on like, my daughter has money, we have insurance, I'm a fucking fight till the day I die with these dudes to the left and right of me, and I feel like I'm a good athlete, I can fucking compete. And so that's really like, that's the truth of me, dog. Like it wasn't like, man, politically driven and I wanted revenge for 9-11. Like part of me was like, yeah, let's do it because of that. But there never was like, I understand all the fine details and why we're here and what we're doing. It was more like when we did have a good op and we apprehended someone or we caught someone that was tied into a, to a to a bombing of this and that and killed this. Like, then it felt good. You're like, fuck yeah, there's, we're, we're doing good. We're, we're, we're mitigating terrorism to coming back to the United States by taking it, taking care of it here. That felt good. That felt like I was justified. Like this whole fucking thing is dope. Uh, but then on the other end of it, like then you see kind of like the residual effects and also like the collateral damage that happens too, to innocent bystanders living in, in that country. Yeah. That's, I mean, that sticks with me. That's odd, right? That's one of those, like, I have a heart for that shit, you know? Good morning, everybody. As you know, 
Change Agents is an Ironclad original, but what you may not know is that for over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of Change Agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand and then this is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. How does it land with you nearly 20 years later? And th these are questions I ask myself. There were a lot of, there was a lot of outside influence and people just coming to fight. And I think it's, it's really a mistake for people to vilify somebody who has a different ideology I or belief and yeah. I, and it's like let's not rack and stack the validity of the belief let's take it at face value that two people believe different things and the depth of their belief is enough that they're willing to go and fight for it <sighs> looking in the rearview mirror 20 years back how does it how does it land in the places that we went being asked to do the things that we did not really having a, an understanding of the politics right. and now having it come out and you have a better understanding of you know, the military industrial complex is a real thing. Yeah. You know, like there is money to be made in warfare. I mean, I remember being at fucking Bagram and the chow hall workers are from like their outsourced contractors from fucking KBR. KBR, Kella Brown and Root. Yeah. And they're like from Kenya. Yes. And I remember one day, like, God, this image has stuck with me forever. I walked outside because Friday's was steak and shrimp night. <laughs> and I it walk, was. I walk by the fucking boxes and it says grade F steak. <laughs> for military and law enforcement use only. Or no, military and prison use only. Oh, wow. Might That's as funny. well say, I'm sure they would serve it to law enforcement officers <laughs> if they could. And I'm just curious. I mean, like, they asked us to go to places and make very consequential decisions. Yeah. Who's going to live and, and who's going to die. Right. And I can't go back and, and communicate with the, the person I was 20 years ago, but how do you feel now making those decisions based in the landscape of what you know now, what you have learned in those 20 years? Because mm. I understand being behind the, 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 being behind the rifle with not a thorough understanding and maybe even not a thorough desire to understand because yeah. you understand that you believe, but you just don't have a better con like this greater context of what the fucking U.S. machine is, specifically yeah. the military industrial complex. Right. It, it never was this like, I'm so patriotic, I'm here for that. And so there always was a doubt whether this is going to be something I... Like, I'm, should we have learned more? Should we have, as individuals, should we have strived to understand our country more being over there? Or is our country able to do those things because there's an endless supply of people that were our age willing to I do mean, so? I it's, mean, it's the poor middle class who fight, right? Like... I needed it yeah. to give my kid an opportunity. I needed it to pay for my own college, let alone my kids. So I can look back and say, there's definitely things that I've held on to and that, I, that the thought of it alone just makes me uncomfortable. Um, and, and I can find this very human, like I understand where they were coming from and where we're coming from and that same kind of dialogue. Uh, but I can't, like, if I had to do it all over, all over again, back in that say, I would do it because I had to. I had no other option. And like I said, the poor middle class fight this war. And, 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 but rightfully so, if I didn't, I don't think I'd be in the position I am today. Yeah. It's definitely been this stepping stone of my progress. And like anyone who's out there in America is like, oh, I don't get opportunities. Like, well, you can, because I, I had to do it. And it get, it's given me, if not just one more step ahead of other people in different areas, right? And for my kids, they've, they'll, they'll, they'll get opportunity because of me serving as well. So, I guess there's the good of it, right? Whatever the fuck, whatever, right, wrong, I don't give a shit, it helped me. So it put me in this position that I can be at where I'm at now. But it doesn't, it doesn't escape me that 
it might not have been the war that was a justifiable one in the sense of like, should we have been there? Should, I don't fucking know. I, don't, I probably don't even want to think about it, to be honest. I'm just like, at the time I needed it, I fucking did it. Um, if my son said he wanted to do it now, whew, that'd be a hard one. I'd say... Would you try to talk him out of it? No, because why I would you I have these thoughts too. They, yeah, why would, why would I want to do that? I don't want to. What I would want to do is just, just for the sake of, of thinking 20 years ahead for him, I would say don't do infantry. I, I would say, I want to say don't. I would highly recommend you do something that you can get out and use. That's what I would say. Transferable job skills. Yes. Uh, and if you want to be hardcore, I just talked to some kid last night online. He's asking me, I'm like, here's what I would do. If you were my son, I would say go Intel, go Ranger. You can have all the challenges, but never really have to be the, the boots on the ground, dude. Um, and you'll get the full experience of like what the special operations community is. And after that, you decide, do I want to go SF? Do I want to go Delta? Whatever the case, right? Do I want to try out for these other, other? And then if not, you get out and then you can still. But then it's like, well, what's you, what are you setting them up for? Well, you're setting them up to, to work for a three-letter agency that might not necessarily be where I want them to go anymore, right? Because it's, like it's like such a contradictory space these days. Seems to be, yeah. Uh... Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting space like no i don't know you know like i said like my son to join the military um i think it'd be great for him for the experience it'd be great to see him challenge himself all those cool things that i think we've learned from the military but the fear of uh him fighting a war that again he would not understand whether why he's even there and and whether he's just a kind of a pawn in that game too and so it's kind of tough it's a weird, really weird time in our, in our in our country and you know as much as if there was a war that kicked off i would want to go defend anyone who innocently wanted to go fight and protect what we have. But uh, I would hate for my own kids to have to fight that war too. It's a tough time, man. Like you look back at, you know, fighting Nazi Germany, a uniformed enemy, that's a fucking easy one. Yeah. You know, Imperial Japan, communism, where, not that I agree with squaring off in fucking trenches and being right. able to like see each other and like, hey guys, <laughs> when we blow a really loud whistle, we're gonna go over this thing and run at that fixed machine gun nest. I'm not advocating for that. But God damn, man, I think right now the last stats I saw, it's like special operations is involved in somewhere between 40 to 60 countries yeah. worldwide on an enemy that can hide in plain sight, that doesn't, yeah, and I don't blame them for not wanting to fight a traditional warfare set. I don't know if I want that for my kids either. I would yeah. I would never try to talk my kids out of service. Looking back now, what I think I would do would be more, I would try to educate them on the potential downside. Like yeah. the things I didn't know anything about. Right. TBI. Yes. Post-traumatic stress. Like we were talking about before we started, the, the stress on family. Yeah, you man. Know, the things, that, like there's such a difference between the price and the cost. Like the price for the military member, you sign your name, bonus which had a few steps they probably weren't upfront about but hopefully you eventually got your bonus <laughs> essentially but the cost is and i say this not realizing that i did this to my family yeah they bear the cost the, absolutely the amount of time gone no, not, absolutely. not even the amount of time gone if i'm being objectively honest about myself and who i am and and trying to own up for where i think i fell short in my life i spent years of physically being present and not even fucking being there Absolutely. If that makes any sense to you, just that <laughs> that's, completely that's... and utterly consumed with something that was taking place thousands of miles away, feeling like I was going to miss out. Yeah. And just being so overly consumed with the job that I was. I mean, I guess I was a parent by title, but no, absolutely, dude. I said I was. Uh, I was a paycheck. I made. I. I felt justified in the fact that I can keep the lights on. That that was enough as being a father. Yeah. You know, and my father was his time his world was working paying but he still was relevant in my life but but i wasn't as relevant as i should have been uh, you know half the time i was drinking when i was home and the memories of my daughter saying hey dad remember when you taught me how to ride a bike i'm like Pfft. no i don't remember because even if i was there, i wasn't really there yeah. i made sure i had something some kind of liquor in me at the same time and my mind is on so many other things when i like i realized that when i went through my divorce and I went to pick up my kids and we're driving eight hours to Del Rio, Texas. And I'm just fucking around in the car, laughing and kind of singing with them. And my daughter in the front seat looked at me and said, Dad, you're really funny. And I was just like, yeah, how the fuck does my kid not know that I'm like, I'm, I've always been like the comic relief of my group. I've always been, 
you know, the jokes or the class clown. But my kids never seen that version of me. They've never even knew that their dad was some kind of a, a funny dude. They thought I was just a stern guy who drank. You know what I mean? And that, that was eight hours of like, holy shit, what do they even know of me? Like, wh what have I ever done for them? I don't, besides paying the bills and keeping the lights on and giving them a house, food and clothes on their back, like, they didn't know my personality as a person, which was fucked up for me, man. It was kind of like the first light of like, man, you gotta become human again for these kids. What are you doing? You know, and that, that ate at me, dude. It still bothers me, you know, that my, you know, my older kids didn't get the best version of me. My younger kids get the, get, they get it all. But the older ones had this, just a shell of a person for so long, dude. And I kept doing it to them, dude. When I joined the border patrol, it was, it was no different. It was just a new mission, you know what I'm saying? And Have you talked to them about it? Yeah, man, we've had those conversations. You know, I, I'm, I'm in a really good place where if I can't speak it, I write it, you know what I mean? And I can, I can definitely tell them through, through letters of like, you know, that version of me was, was such a, was, was so focused on something that was irrelevant. You know what I mean? I was so focused on being good at my job. I was so focused on being good at the team. Um, and which justified it did pay the bills. And it, it did. I was doing everything dads would do, but it's definitely an empty vessel just sitting in the room with them, you know? And so um, they know that now. I feel bad about it. I think I'll always feel bad. It'll always be the guilt of like, damn, man, if I can go back, that's the ch thing I would change for them. But what they have now is the best, healthiest version of dad that they've ever seen. Um, and even my 21 year old, she, she, she's turning 21 here soon. Um, you know, she's got a good version of me that could admit like I sucked. I could admit that I wasn't, I was probably too stern on her and I was too protective and I didn't allow her to really exist because I was too nervous of her fucking up her own life. And these things that I did for her unintentionally, what I thought was gonna be for the best interest of her. And to, to her as an adult, turn around and be like, no, nah, I fucking hated that. I was like, oh, fuck. And I'm sorry, dude, you know what I mean? And I think I've been really good about humanizing myself and saying, as I was raising you, I was growing as well, and I was learning, and what I, what, the way my dad raised me, I, what I believed to be correct, uh, wasn't, wasn't necessarily right, you know what I mean? And I've had to learn that as an adult myself to realize like I don't wanna be that type of father, I don't wanna, not that my dad was bad, I'm saying it's a different generation of how we raise kids. Yeah, you it's know? just a different philosophy. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I've transitioned a lot of things in life, and. I think the, the best thing I've done for them is to be able to, to grow and think outside the box of what I believe to be normal. I think it's actually a good thing for kids to see their parents reinvent themselves. Oh, absolutely. Because if they don't see that as an example, or if a parent can't talk to a kid and say, like, I fucked that up. Yeah. And you have to, dude. You have to admit to them you fucked up. I don't think a lot of people do. I think that's the ego, right? It's the ego's like, no, 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 dad's always right. Like, no, dad fucks up all the time, dude. Yeah. You know? my do So I'm sober, right? I, I took on this whole, I said, fuck it, I'm not gonna drink no more because of all these things, right? Our friends committing suicide left and right. Yeah. Almost every single one of them has been drunk. Um, I hated society telling us this is what we do. We drink, fuck, fight, right? Ranger, special operations, all this stuff. Um, I was just tired of telling myself this is what I had to be. And as I've gone through this transition of wellness and, and really trying to find myself, drinking became the one thing that was the crippler. I needed to stop. Uh, and I told you, I couldn't even remember memories that my kids remembered because I was drunk. So when I stopped drinking, it was the first like, damn, that's a huge shift on their world. They used to be the ones like, dad, you need another beer? Yeah, please, thank you. You know what I mean? And I didn't see anything wrong with that. Now I'm like, that's embarrassing, dog. That's embarrassing to say, hey, can you grab me another beer? It like, can ingrain weird habits in them too. Oh, absolutely. Dude, I, only, I was excited as a kid to grab my dad's beer. That was an honorable position in my household. He trusted me with a beer. Hell yeah, I'll go grab, dad, you want another one? I loved that position in life growing up. That was so valuable to me because in a Latino household, that was like the thing, bro. That's not uncommon for, the, for that, that's normal. But as I got older, I was like, Oh, dude, that's that, that's not a good look, and, and, and not outside views on me. I don't give a fuck what that is, but for me to them and saying I'm promoting alcoholism every time I hand, I ask them to go grab me a beer. My 13 year old daughter now. The other day I asked her, I said, "Do you remember when I used to drink?" She goes, "No, I didn't know you drank." I was like, "Dude, Jackpot. yes, <laughs> bro, that is like." I'm an emotional mess all the time, but this like that's one of those things where you're like, dude. I mean, you're a thespian, so. Yeah, I am an actor. <laughs> <laughs>
But that is one of those, when I heard her say that, it was like, dude, that's cool, man. That's cool that they get to experience that. They've, some of my kids have seen me drink daily, often, weekends, birthdays. It was like, go to a kid's party and I have a cooler in the back. You know what I mean? So now, they'll never see me drink alcohol ever again. I might have a fake beer, uh, non-alcoholic. I might have, you know, a uh, Bloody Mary that's a virgin Bloody Mary. But they'll never see me drunk. They'll never see me drink alcohol again. And I, I imagine that's a lot of value for them. I imagine they're going to be like, damn, if dad can stop, I, there's nothing I couldn't do or something. I don't know. I hope it does. I think those things imprint deeper than we have an understanding of. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's a lot of value that can come from just your behavior, absent saying anything. Yeah. And I think that's the most important thing that comes from having parents involved in your life is modeling the behavior. Because it's not always modeled great. Right. You know? No, for sure. I, uh, you know, look at the community that we came from. Like, I'm not going to say they pushed alcohol. I'm not going to say they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. But at a formidable time in my life, you know, I'm in my late 18, early 19, well before I'm fucking 21 years old, I'm yeah. surrounded by a group of people where, hey, it's always five o'clock somewhere. What do we do every Friday? We yep. do a grinder PT and a kegger. Oh, that's funny. How do I remember that? Because the new guys had to pay for it. I'm like, <laughs> let's take the most fiscally broke person at this command yes. and then pitch them together with other broke E4s and make them buy kegs every Friday. <laughs> and then, then we'll wonder why DUIs are a thing, and we have to have a safety stand down. Yeah, Ranger Battalion almost always has the highest drinking incidence in every post they're at. It's like, it genuinely is part of our culture. I don't know whether it's promoted or what, it just becomes part of the culture. Yeah. And um, I think it's also what's killing a lot of us. It doesn't help. I mean, it's, I mean the no. science is completely on the side of it being a depressant. Yeah. Almost, almost all of the, God, I'm actually trying to think if I can, if I have an example of a friend that killed himself who was sober at the time. You're, you're not gonna find it. You're not gonna find it, because I've done the same thing. I don't think I have an example no, of one. You can almost find every single one. Every single one. You go ask, go at, look for that. I promise you, every single one. Besides, I have a couple buddies who died overdose on, uh, on painkillers or heroin. Besides that, yeah. find it. I, I don't know if there is, genuinely. It's a crazy thing. So there's a study. There's this white paper study. I was doing, this, doing dumb college courses and I still can't pass. But uh, um, <laughs> I'm like a doctor, bro. I got like nine years in this shit. I still can't get a degree. But while I'm doing this, white paper study shows a TBI, post-traumatic stress, within alcoholism. It creates this... Uh, Just the trifecta? Yeah, it's, it's like a chemical reaction in your brain that creates suicide ideology. Like, hold up. There's a white paper study. That means like... They've got verifiable data that proves this. Um, and and so, enough to turn it into a study. Yes. There's enough test subjects that it's, it has a meaningful data set when they get it together. And so you're telling me almost everyone in our communities who probably suffer from the same flashbangs, all the training we've done, all the things. Yeah. We, that we already, you almost walk out of the military with that combination. You would be lucky to not walk out of it. Absolutely. You'd be an anomaly to not have at least two of the three. Yeah. And that trifecta for sure. Yeah. How'd you know it was time for you to walk away from being a ranger? Um, you know, I, I, when we lost, we lost Bramon Barraza in 2006. And that hit hard for me, right? Those, it's still to this day, man. I, I if I think about it too much. Overseas? Yeah. They, they, well, I was graduated ranger school. Uh, I came back with an injury. I couldn't deploy because of it. I had a brachial plexus nerve damage, so this right, this whole right arm wasn't working, and it was slow to slowly come back. It took a year for it to fully come back. Uh, and so while I was, they sent me to language school while I was waiting for this arm to heal. And when I got back on the reach on, on, on rear D, I was waiting to for them to redeploy. Um, and about a few days before they redeployed, man, they were killed in a in a in Ramadi and during a mission. And you know, to get that call, it was it was the first. During my time in losing someone at Ranger Battalion in a combat op. So Sergeant Red got the call um, and related to us. Me and him were in the room already crying. We're like, oh my God, Sergeant Bronze and Sergeant Brim. Like, what the fuck? To us, that's that was our those were our superheroes. Those are the dopest dudes in my opinion. And their personalities too, like all of it. Full package, funny dudes, badasses, you look up to them, and they were killed. 
the best of the best that day. Um, and all I wanted to do is get my Ranger tab and be able to, to attach back into their team, try and get in their team and be a part of that group because I love them so much. And then they were killed. And, and it was hard for me, man. It was hard for me because, you know, when you look up to someone like that and you know you live in this game where, where at any time anyone else could get our tickets punched. Got it. But I never thought the best of the best in my world would be that. And so I think it put things in perspective. And so I'm just, I'm a thinker of it all. I'm like, those dudes are so dope. And they were killed. And what's that make me? And that made me really question, do I want to try and get out? Because they wanted to. They both had a conversation. We've, we've had all this talk about why to get out, when to get out, this and that, what's next. And they didn't get that chance. And so all these things are in my head, man. Like, Part of me wants to try out for, for, for Delta, right? Part of me wanted to try and, try and go out for, for more elite and see how far I can push myself. The other part, I wanted to go to, to tra tra train for best ranger company. I had all these, I, like, I wanted to stay in for things that I thought were interesting to chase, but then to see two of the best get taken out, then it's like, well, hold on. That means any of us can get taken out. Obviously, obviously, but like, it actually happened. Um, and it destroyed me, dude. It destroyed me internally. It, it, it destroyed my confidence, you know? And so on the next deployment, um, I was extremely nervous that like, I, I shouldn't be here anymore. I gotta go, I gotta go. You know what I mean? My head's like, I'm gonna do this job, but I, I know for a fact my heart was gone from it. Like I didn't have the same thought of like, fuck it. I'm now I'm like, no, no, get out of this and go do something different. So it in internally changed me to the, that's a wild headspace to be overseas in. It's the worst headspace to be in, dog. Like, you don't want to go on missions like that. You don't want to be in charge of people like that, dude. And, you know, and, and, and that's, not, that's not good, right? That's, that's not the place you want to be. And so I remember, I was like, the first six cigarettes I've ever, I've only smoked six cigarettes in my fucking life, was after off, dude, after missions. I'm like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and I hate the fucking things. I don't, even, Dude, I don't like cigarettes. I didn't even know what I was doing, but it was just kind of like, oh my God, man. Like, and I kept thinking, like, stop thinking about it. Just do the job. And we go on a mission to come back. I'm like, okay, we made it again. Like, and it was just like really shitty space, you know? And I have, you know, my, my wife at the time, it's like, get out or I'm going to leave you, which like, I wanted to be a dad. So I was like, I don't want to deal with that drama. That's a mess, you know? And then it's like, Sean Bronson and Brim were killed and I did their funeral, right? And so like, I'm seeing all of the heartbreak and all the pain and, and how much it damaged us as well, right? And, and all of it was like, nah, bro, this is uh. It's ain't for me no more, man. I gotta try and do something different. And that's not easy to do, right? That's not easy to do because there's still the FOMO, you know? The next deployment after, um, Leroy Petrie, you know, Medal of Honor recipient, lost his hand, saving one of the dudes that I was, you know, one of the young dudes I sold his first, that he bought his first car off me, like one of my young dudes. And so that ate me alive that, I, man, I couldn't be there and I, and, and I feel bad, but I'm like, it's just time to do more. And coincidentally, Sergeant Braza was the dude I had a conversation with about Border Patrol. We were in a squad room together cleaning rifles and everyone's saying like, I wanna be a cop, I wanna be a firefighter, you know? I was like, I wanna be a pararescue jumper because it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do something, right? And then, and it was funny, I wanted to do pararescue when I got out, like, let me just try the medical side. And then I was like, well, maybe let me do a smoke jumper because my dad's a firefighter. So now I'll do, we're talking. Right, that seemed cool as fuck. So all these things, ideas, but he said Border Patrol. And I was like, homie, you're Mexican. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Because the only thing I knew with Border Patrol was those mint green trucks when I go to Rosarito with my family, my dad's doing a 50 mile bike ride. And all I ever knew was like, they're not good dudes, right? Those guys are stopping. I don't know anything at the time of my life other than my grandmother came across and uh, and Sergeant Barraza was talking about Border Patrol. And I'm like, that's crazy, Sergeant. Like, why, why would you want to do Border Patrol? And like, genuinely ignorant to what the hell the job was and more so like you're Mexican and you want to stop Mexicans from coming across. That's where my, that's how intelligent I was at the time about the whole thing. And he's like, they had one of these best special operations units. They have federal funding. He goes, you could pretty much become do, doing what rangers do here, essentially, but in your own country, and doing it at home, uh, and continue to just, you know, his whole thing was like, what better job in the world to, to jump out of planes, shoot guns, blow shit up. And he just wanted to try and do the same thing back home. And so I was like, man, that's interesting. So I started looking into it a little bit more. And I was like, okay, well, maybe that's an option. I got out of active duty on my, after my third deployment. 
I was just kind of a mess. And I've never said that fully and truly out loud. And hearing it, I feel bad that I was even there with that kind of mindset, you know. Um, but, you know, I went straight to the prison as a prison guard because it was the easiest job I can get at a private prison. In my uh, bio. Let's pause there yeah. for a second. <laughs> I suspect that you have a story or two from your time as a private prison guard. Yeah. From seeing it from the prison guard side of the house, I mean, there's a whole conversation between privatized prisons versus yeah, state that's, and that's, federal prisons. That's a crazy conversation itself, yeah. How, what was that experience like, at working as a prison guard at a private prison? You know, even at the time, too, I was so ignorant to what, what the private prison whole industry was about and whether it was a good or a bad thing. It was a means to pay my family bills and it paid better than anything else and I can get that job instantly. The academy was two weeks PowerPoint, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, this is a joke. I just got out of Rainier Town, just got back from deployment. I was still on my terminal leave when I landed that job, you know what I mean? So I'm like collecting the check while I'm in the academy and it's like, it's, this is a good thing. So for me, it was like the best thing I could have landed for my job at the time for the, in the fastest amount of time. Um, but then I was like, Dude, what am I doing? This is crazy. The first day we go walk the floor as like new trainees, they put us in, they took us to a SEG unit and SEG is like segregation, right? They're 23 hours SEGged up, one hour recreation. They're like the, the biggest probably threats in the prison. Um, the biggest issue, issues, right? They cause issues, so SEG them up for whatever reasons. It could be gang stuff, it could be, you know, violent history, whatever it is. And I remember them, walking in there and they know it's a new class of people and they just start kicking the door and telling us they're gonna kill us, they're gonna, they're gonna rape us, they're gonna, all these things. And that was probably the first time I had like the chills up my neck and I was like, damn, I don't know if I wanna do this. <laughs> like, That's very Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, dude, it was like, you know, I was like, oh man, I'm really questioning what am I doing? I almost thought about calling the recruiter for Ranger Battalion back. I'm like, let me get back in the, this is crazy, man. What am I doing, dog? Like. What the fuck? And um, eventually, you know, they put they put on a show for us. They tried to intimidate, and they did. They didn't intimidate the fuck out of me because I was like, yeah, this is. Uh, I don't know if this is what I want to do for myself, you know. Um, you know, and and you know, within the first month, I got into this big prison fight. Uh, two 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 inmates were suited up, and um, I was like the young buck, bro. You know, I'm the young dude that is athletic and willing and they all knew like on my background so they're like hey you're the you're the team lead on a cell extraction that I've only done in training and never really done it you know what I mean <laughs> um <laughs> and they're like you're the you're the you're the team leader and I'm like okay I know the rules like I'm third in the door fine and they're like all right so you do your little interview in the cameraman and you know I'm the first man in and I'll be the shield man. The second, I'm the second man in and I'll be the shield man for the second. And it's this kind of like, it's kind of like there's an order of operations of how you enter a room with, with yeah. two inmates. Uh, and we have two shield guys and they're supposed to pin them. And then everyone else comes in and I'm kind of directing traffic, but as well as I'm going to be grabbing a certain appendage, whether the arm, the arm, the leg, the leg, right? So you got arm, arm, leg, leg. Everyone has to grab one kind of total control of that individual. And so the plan sounds dope, dude. Um, and I picked probably the best I possibly could. And there was another dude, I won't say his name, but I knew I didn't want him on the team, but he's the only dude besides a bunch of old women. So I was like, all right, bro, you're on. You know what I mean? He was like 350 pounds and, <laughs> and he was so nervous about getting sued that I swear I, he was fighting against me the whole time in there. But I remember I, they put toilet paper on their little, you know, it's a little window. And the captain's like, all right, man, look, they're destroying the room. We're going to have to go in there and let's just throw some gas in there and then let's go get them. I'm like, all right, cool. So they pop open the food trap and throw the gas. And it's a kind of a CSOC mix, right? It's, it's just... Sounds delightful. Yes. It's <laughs> money, right? It's money. <laughs> they grabbed it and I heard a bloom and I was like... Toilet. Back window, dude. They shoved it down this hole. They created it out of the back. They broke a hole in the window and they were able to shove it out. I can't see that. Eventually we find that out. But I'm like, did they shove it down the toilet? What just happened? And the captain's like, well, well, they don't have nothing else they can throw at us. Open the food trap, boom, they hit us with a porcelain toilet. Why is there a porcelain toilet in a fucking prison? I don't know, but that's the next thing that hit me in the thighs, right? I'm like, what the fuck? And then he goes, they definitely have nothing now. Let's go. 
opens the fucking door, bro. The first dude goes in, slips and falls. The next dude slips and falls, and it's just me and this motherfucker looking at me. This dude's six foot two, stocky Indian dude. The other guy's trying to get out. I see him go right past me, <laughs> and everyone else is coming in to tackle him. So as they're having a commotion, this dude's looking at me, and I see this, like, really slow. And I'm like, but he has a sock in his hand. I'm like, what is he doing? It, everything stopped, bro. It was like nothing in combat I've ever seen happen like this. It was completely like slow motion. He's kind of waving his hand at me. And I was like, this is fucking strange. And then it sped up and I realized he's hitting the fuck out of me with a sock. And he has a piece of the broken toilet in it. Now we have our little suited up outfit, but I hear him go, clack, prop, prop. And I'm like, fuck, he's trying to kill me. I grab this dude, and which is completely against the rules. I close fist, just started punching the motherfucker in the face, right? Luckily, the camera dude at the same time is having trouble with his footing, so the camera's doing this shit, you know what I mean? And I'm like, fuck, fuck, and I'm just fighting this dude. I was raised fighting, so I felt confident, but I was so like, what are the rules? Are, you know, what's the ROE? What, what, all this stuff is in my head. I'm gonna get fired, but I'm gonna have to die in this. I ain't trying to die in here, so like, it just kind of went to like, Full on, like, let's just survive. And I started hitting this dude. As I'm hitting this dude, we both lose our footing and slip on the same soaked up floor that they created. As we go down, he dislocates his shoulder and I'm still like, motherfucker, go oh my God. You know, until they pulled me off and they're like, he's done, he's done, he's done. I was like, Jesus, fuck. We, we cuff the dude, take him out. He ends up kicking a fucking nurse in the face. I take him down again. Like it was a mess, bro. Eventually they take him to the ER because of his shoulder and done. The shift's over, the captain was like, bro, that was the craziest cell extraction I've ever seen in my, my history of doing this. He's been in corrections for 15 years. He goes, I've never seen one as crazy as that. You did, you did a great job. And I'm like, cool, man. I drive home, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, what am I doing? This is the craziest thing I've ever fucking had to do. I had to fight a dude today. And I didn't get a bonus, I don't get nothing. I was like, this is stupid, dude. I went online and read what this dude did and he did some of the most gruesome things I've ever read, ever to a door-to-door -door salesman. He attempted to kill her by choking her, it didn't work, he put, his, he put his belt around her neck, didn't work, he put Clark's bleach down her throat, didn't work, drowned her in the fucking tub. Jesus. So I'm reading this, I'm like, this dude had nothing to lose. And we, we, we scrapped it out. And luckily by chance, him dislocating his shoulder, like it, it worked out. But I, if you talk about post-traumatic stress, homie, I did not want to go back to work. I think I called in the next day, like, no, nah, I'm good. And I said to like, <laughs> It's kind of like, you gotta get back on that horse. I'm like, oh God, dude, do I really want to do this crap, man? Like, do I really want to show up to this stupid ass job making $23 an hour? Like, I'd rather go back to the military, send me to Iraq, homie, like send me anywhere but fucking prison, dog. I was stuck there for another two years, bro. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna assume your job satisfaction level was at an all time low. It was crazy, man. Um, you know, two more years of just like working there. I've just, I applied for the Border Patrol, failed their first written test, then, Three months later, I could reapply. They revised their test, so now that score is passing, so I'm back. So they lowered their standards to get a guy like me in, apparently, whatever it was. Then the hiring process for the Border Patrol took me about two years because I got activated to drill sergeant school. Came back, boom. So those two years of working there, it was probably more like a year and nine months because the three years I was gone for, for drill sergeant school, was just, the, like, it was a terrible time. I'm not saying working in prison wasn't it did its job and helped me pay my bills, but I knew right when I got there, I was on my way out. I knew like the first exit plan I had, I'm out. Would I go back to a prison as a warden? Hell yes, that would be cool. But I never want to be boots on the ground dude doing it because that job, um, bro, that job was not, is not something I would want to do, Dana. And I respect the motherfuckers who do. I respect that. That's a, it's a good, I actually tell people, go be corrections, bro. It's a, it's a decent job. <laughs> But like, I think it's a decent job, but man, I, I guess from, from all the little scraps I got into, all the little bullshit, um, yeah, man, I'm good. I don't want to do that no more. You know what I mean? There was, you know, there was cool conversations. There was interesting shit. The prison was like a, it's a, I, I'm not stupid to think that I couldn't have done one thing wrong and landed myself in prison and then by circumstance having to make more mistakes and staying in there longer. So I'm not oblivious to that, right? This part of this whole, like, I can take a look into it and be like, I, I get it. And I don't hate no one for in there, I don't, none of that shit. Um, but like, I was like, okay, my time here is done. Let's go to the Border Patrol. Are you looking for a change agent in the energy space? Look no further. Ketone IQ is a category leader. Fuel does not need to be filled with caffeine and sugar. HVMN is changing the narrative. No sugar. No caffeine, no BS. 
It's just calm, clean energy on demand that improves performance and cognition. HVMN was awarded a $6 million Phase 2 STTR by the U.S. Special Operations Command to produce a ketone-based product that would improve performance at altitude and protect against cognitive loss in hypoxic environments. I'll be honest with you, the flavor is rough, but what's real is the energy, the sustained energy that you will get when you take Ketone IQ. Actually, probably my favorite thing about it though, beyond the energy that you get from it or in addition to the energy that you get from it, is its size. I mean, you can stuff a couple of these in your backpack. It's not bulky. It's not a full-size drink. Throw it in your bag. Take one when you need it, and you're off and running with clean, sustained energy. Please go check out our partner, HVMN, the brand behind Ketone IQ, at hvmn.com slash change agents. Hit you with that one more time. Let's do it military phonetically. Hotel Victor Mike November.com slash change agents. Still got it. It's no big deal. To receive 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. And then did you end up going to Bortac? It sounds like. I eventually became a Borstar uh, okay. agent attached to Bortac. Um, Before we get into your Border Patrol experience. Yeah. Tell me about how your grandmother came to the country, because I think it's a very interesting yeah. juxtaposition. <laughs> Yeah, so my grandmother crossed the border in El Paso when she was, I believe it was something around like 18. Um, she had a sister who was born, because at the time the borders weren't like this kind of solidified thing. People would come across and work and all that. My, my grandfather was born in America, so my grandfather was already here. He was a first generation American. My grandmother came from Mexico and they would come across here and there, but her sister passed away and who was an American citizen. And my grandmother stole her identity so she could be an American citizen. So eventually she stayed and they rooted up in Conotillo, El pa uh, Conotillo Texas, which is just kind of a, a small little connection to El Paso. And, um, you know, it was an interesting thing to hear. You know, my, my mother was, a, was, was raised in kind of like the poverty of hard work and, and agricultural work. You know, she, she, the family wasn't oblivious to picking fruit picking cotton, you know what I mean? Um, they were just poor, you know what I mean? They were, they were poor, it was a, the poor era of, you know, a used toy for Christmas kind of time, you know what I mean? They were making it work, they, were, they believed in the American dream, they were working their ass off to try and make it, make it a thing, and they did well, you know, they did well. Um, and, you know, my grandfather tried to serve in the, in the army, and I think he got sick and got chaptered out at one point. <laughs> Something silly, like, I, I've, I've gone through their documents and checking out, I'm like, did he serve, man? It's gonna be an awesome story. I'm like, oh, he got kicked out for medical reasons. Okay, fuck, you know what I mean? But, you know, he believed in America. That's cool, you know what I mean? My great-grandfather used to break horses for, for the army. You know, that's cool, you know? So the family was very patriotic in a sense. Um, and my grandmother came here for the belief of, of what America is, and she was always super proud of, like, everything I did, even when I was a board trainer, she was proud of it, dude. She was just proud of me, you know? Uh, and so I started to kind of understand, like, Sergeant Barraza's look on it. You know, I started to understand, like, man, I'm proud of being an American, but I'm a Mexican-American, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's okay. You know, sometimes society wants to make you feel like it's not, right? Sometimes society wanted to make me feel like, uh, you know, it's crazy, man. Sometimes I was too dark-skinned for some friends and I was too light-skinned for others. Or I didn't speak good enough Spanish so I can be considered Mexican, Mexicano, Chicano, or, 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 or I was just dark enough where everyone would consider me the beaner in the room. You know what I mean? It's this really weird thing growing up here in LA. We have every shade of Latino, and sometimes you're not, you're not enough, and sometimes you're too much. And that follows all the way till being a border patrol agent. You know what I mean? And then the dichotomy of being Mexican American and a border patrol agent confused people, just like it did me back in the day in the conversation with Sergeant Braza. I was like, bro, oh, that's weird. And then you start to get it. You know, then you start to really understand, no, man, we do have to protect our country, right? 9-11 happened, the, the, the onset of Homeland Security is now a thing, you know? And, and you start to see the significance of why, it all, why it's all important. And that's where, you know, when, she, when, when, when I questioned why I would do it and I questioned and thought about it, my parents were like, do it, why not? I think it's good. My thought of my grandmother coming across was like always there in the back of my head, like she came here for a reason. And I feel like I'd be disrespectful to not uphold that same belief system of why she came to America and for the opportunity of it. 
Was it what you thought it was going to be? You know, I think I thought there was going to be a lot more, like, get out of here, Mexican kind of <laughs> agency. You know what I mean? I thought it was going to be more of like. So you thought you could be working with some racist fucks? Yes, dude. I genuinely, I thought. But then you get to the academy, and it's like seventy percent Mexicans, right? It's like seventy percent Hispanics, dude. You're like, oh fuck, we're all we're all doing this. And then the guys who were white that were Mormon spoke better Spanish than I ever did, bro. And I was like, damn, <laughs> homie. <laughs> I sat next to this, this dude named Lee. He was spouting out Spanish during the Spanish test, and I, I stopped taking the test. I was like, who the fuck is this kid speaking fluent Spanish? So I got stuck in the Spanish portion. He goes <laughs> to be a more trade and full. I was like, man. Yeah, dude, it was, uh, it was cool. It was, it, was, it was a good career field. And it actually, I think it, I think it put it better into perspective of why a lot of Latinos do the job. Like, you can ask every... Border agent who is Hispanic, whether they're Mexican, first generation, second generation, doesn't matter. They all really believe in what America stands for. It's to me, it's probably the most patriotic agency in America because they really believe in protecting the nation and not on this like political politicized version of it, right? Not this like bigoted idea. It's like, no, like genuinely like, well, there's policies in place and do your do me a favor, follow them, or else I have to do my job. You know what I mean? And then the layers on top of that of like human trafficking, drug trafficking, um, manipulation, you know, all those other things are there too now. You know what I mean? And so then it became a very multi-dimensional job. So if you watch the news. Yes. Or you're on social media, there's two narratives. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm painting with a broom here, people. So yes. give me some room. Yeah. Everything at the border is perfect. Everything at the border is fucked. Those are the two different narratives. And yeah. People can align whatever they want to based off of what side of the aisle that they are on. I feel like both of those narratives are completely fucked and they're weaponized and politicized. I agree. What was your reality actually working at the border? And then I guess the second question on top of that is, why the fuck can't anybody talk openly and honestly about what's happening there? It's great. So my experience at the border there's obviously an influx of immigration. And immigration, as in immigration, as in people coming across the border in waves is 100% uh, derived by whatever political policy is in at the moment. And I say that as in, there's things that shift in immigration because of circumstance. Part of Texas at one point had a policy in place that was, if you come across, you're going to jail for 30 days. Part of uh, San Diego had a policy where, like, you can come across six times before we actually make you do prison time, jail time. So every part of the border has a different, uh, I guess, position based on the state and the jurisdiction and what is implemented at that time. Crazy part about that is that the communication, right? The you know, in the military, we call it the Joe Network. Like, the dissemination of information in Mexico is money, son. Because as soon as they know that you'll go to prison here, they shift gears and go here. Yeah. And so then you have a huge influx in another area that's not as strict or that's more lenient on, on, on immigration. So then the drug trafficking organizations or smuggling organizations, they shift gears and go, right? How fast could they auto like that? Dude, I swear to you, it's within months. Within months, they hear it, boom. You know, at one point before I was a border agent, there was a time when they, was, they were getting, and it's still kind of, kind of similar, they would come across and just ask for their paper. Like, hey, can I get my paper, my paper? And what that meant was like, un papel, un papel. And they knew what that meant was that for them was a thing called a notice to appear, an NTA. And that meant like, okay, we're over, we're over, we're overdone here. We don't have space for you, but I'm gonna give you this paper. And this is the date to show for the immigration judge to plead your case. Because people are coming over and saying they're political asylum cases. Like, cool, not my job as a border train to determine that. That's, that's another thing. That's not my job. My job is to go ahead and you came over illegally, right? Not at a port of entry. So then I'll do my job and apprehend you because you broke that law. From here, I'm going to process you based on what you tell me. You say, hey, I'm a political asylum. I was like, oh, yeah, really? Let me, let me, let me ask my question because there's an interview there because you can't just say I'm from Mexico and I'm claiming political asylum because I'm from Mexico. Like, well, currently, what we have established in the United States and determines that you are not a political asylum opportunity because of there is no issues in Mexico that we deem that. But in America, like, but we do deem, say, El Salvador, El Salvador at some point, right? So if you're El Salvador and you come across, say, political asylum, you're just like, where are you from, El Salvador? Oh, okay, cool. Processes this as a, a political asylum. Still broke the law, 
right? You still broke the law. You came across illegally. So now you're still getting apprehended for that. And now we're going to set up uh, your paperwork as such and hand you off to the next people accordingly, which is going to be ICE um, or deportation, right? They're going to send them to wherever facility until they wait for the immigration judge to determine their case. The immigration judge will make a determination. So all we do is process that paperwork and hand them off. That's really what we do. Uh, and it only, and it's always determined based on where they were apprehended, where they crossed essentially, and what that state has in order for their political, for their, for their immigration law, uh, and as well as what the kind of the political situation is immigration wise, right? And so, uh, so something that like more recent for us during COVID, right? There was a thing called, I believe it was called Title 42. I think it was, was I don't want to speak on that, but I believe that's what it was called. Uh, and what that meant was like now there's a crisis because of COVID. And during that COVID crisis, they, they wouldn't be punished as harshly because say they're coming across for medical reasons or whatever the case, right? There's, there's this whole argument on that. But either way, that's what that pretty much gave the opportunity. So when people found out like, oh, hey, there's this thing called Title 42. I think it's Title 42. I don't want to speak. I think it is. But let's just use that for reference. Say, oh, the Title 42, this is what it means, right? And so they're like, oh, shit, let's go. Boom. So the big influx you saw at the border is because they knew that there was a different policy in place. And that policy meant that they would be more lenient on them. So like, let's give it a shot. Boom. Huge influx of immigration. Border trays and border patrol stations are not built to take on more than a certain amount, which is very low, maybe 25 people. Uh, and so you get over hundreds and thousands and thousands of people like, well, how do you fix that? There's, no, there's nothing in the system that tells them how to manage that besides package, package them up and hand them off to ICE to do whatever they need to do with them, right? So that creates this wave of, of overwhelming uh, situation that the immigration judges didn't have enough, enough uh, capability to see these in time. So you have people that are in holding for a very long time, you know? And so it's like this, it's just, Anytime that something changes or shifts in the political position or the political um, uh, immigration policy, it creates a whole ripple effect of change down the border. And it's almost always never good for us. You know what I mean? So, so it's been crazy right now. Like they're completely overwhelmed, but as well as like, uh, there is very little happening in the sense of, because of that Title 42, um, there was very little repercussion of coming across. So then might as well keep trying. So you kind of had this revolving door of immigration continuing to come across with no repercussions. And so it's hard. That's overwhelming, man. That's exhausting for an agent to continue to try and uphold uh, their job and do the right thing. But in, in the same turn, uh, it's just nonstop. It's exhausting, right? You know what I mean? And then the lack of border change, because a lot of border changes are walking away from the career field because all the, the negative publicity it doesn't feel good when your family tells you, like, oh, you're, you're just like, you know, you're just like the Nazi guy, right? Whether you're holding these kids, like, oh, dude, it's so politicized that it made them uncomfortable and a lot of them didn't want to do their job. And then currently right now, the border trial is one of the highest uh, suicide rates based on the, the per capita, right, in, in, in law enforcement. It's insane. I didn't know that. Because <laughs> I don't think a lot of people understand how you have immigration, then you have um, uh, homeland security. There's two, 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 two different faces here, right? Sometimes the argument's the same for both. Sometimes it's not. And then you have people fighting over something like, well, wait, you're fighting over the wrong thing. You're talking about immigration, but I'm talking about homeland security. You see what I'm saying? And that's where now you have an even bigger argument here. After 9-11, homeland security became a thing. I think it's very valuable, right? It's kind of TSA and all these things. I think it's valuable. They're a pain in my ass. You know, I get, you know, I get pecker checked all the goddamn time by them, but I'm all, okay, I'll deal with that for the sense of safety. In the border, it's what do you want me to do? Because right now, I know for a fact, hand to God, know for a fact, you got... People from Africa coming across, you got people from China coming across, you got people from Afghanistan coming across. Okay? I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying I should probably look into that a little bit, don't you think? Because if we don't, we're setting ourselves up for potential risk. That's homeland security. Immigration is, yeah, there is countries that are struggling with political asylum issues, right? There's countries that that need support. And we're America. We should be able to take that on because this is what we do. We're built on immigration. We're built on immigrants, right? And so, yeah, we should look at this. And we should look at this fair, and we should give them an opportunity to come here to America and, and find the same value that we have here, because this is what we're built on. But this and this are two different. And how do you differentiate the two and one border? If someone comes across, I don't know who the fuck they are. I don't know what, they're, what, they're, what their intentions are. So all I can do is stop them, apprehend them, process them, and hand them off to the, to the system that we have in place currently, ICE. Uh, deportation, immigration judge. That's it. So during this whole 
political war from, I mean, as continues, you, you, people aren't defining the difference between your Customs and Border Patrol agent over there at the POE, the Border Patrol agent himself, right, the Customs and Border Patrol, Border Protection, the Border Patrol, ICE, and deportation. Right now, it's all one thing, Border Patrol. And they're throwing stones like a motherfucker at Border Patrol, like, we're the problem, like, Border Patrol's the problem, Border Patrol's like, like to me, in my opinion, Border Patrol is the biggest safe haven and human, uh, uh, humanitarian mission in our time. Border Patrol saves more lives and stops more drugs than any organization in the nation. We stop more drugs than the DEA. We actually hand off all of our stuff to the DEA or, or local law enforcement who wants to take the case, right? But that's not, that's not talked about, you know what I mean? That's not talked about how many people we rescue every year from harsh conditions of weather, harsh conditions of the environment, um, and as, as well as any kind of incident that happens on the border. We're doing everything we can from, from rescuing people from drowning, everything. Is that where the Borsar falls in? I'm assuming Absolutely. it's border search and rescue? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and so like, it's not my job to question why someone crosses. My job is that if I've, if I've been able to catch you from doing that, I got you. I'm gonna process you and let the immigration policies, whatever's in place, do its job. Don't get mad at me for doing my job. You broke the law, that's it. Even if you're a political asylum, you broke the law, right? If you wanna go the right way, go through the POE, go through the process, that's not breaking the law, you're doing it the right way and you can get that process too. It takes a while, I think that's the biggest problem. Like we do have, we don't have a streamlined approach to this, so that's why there's a lot of frustration. Got it, I get it. But now all these, throughout the years, you have a BORTAC team, which is kind of like the tactical team. Uh, it's like a SWAT team. I got all this gripe because people don't think they're as cool as they, I think they're dope as fuck, right? I think they're-, they're What do they usually get used for though? Multiple different things. So um, we can do basic operations on, uh, in your area, right? It could be um, intel-driven uh, operations to, I, I would say, to disrupt drug trafficking organizations. Okay. Boom, right? So that's, that's one of our main missions. Two, uh, you have the U.S. Marshals who don't have the, the capabilities we do. We'll, we'll do warrants for them. Boom, anything on the border, we got you, call us up, we got you, you know? Um, anything that's a potential fugitive risk to head to Mexico or Canada, it's us. Um, things like that. So pretty much anything in the area that needs it. The active shooter that happened in Uvalde. Yeah. Them, right? Why? Because they're, they're, within, they're within the area, they have the training. Uh, you know, they, it's just kind of, they're, they're a day to day, they work and train every single day. They're, the, they're probably the best suited for that job. And so a, that, tact, a tactical team on top of the traditional border patrol. Right. So they all had to be border traders for two years before they did that. So they know how to track groups. They know how to do the job. They know how the process works and everything. But now they got specific training. They've gone through a selection. And now their job is to be the force on the border if needed. And how does Borsar tie into that? So Borsar came in part for the same exact reason of like illegal immigration and and immigrants getting lost and dying out there from heat, from environment, right? So all that. And so they said, you know what, let's let's create a team that can help search and rescue for that situation, but as well as a medic for the border patrol agents that are boots on ground. They've transitioned to kind of a search, trauma and rescue to this more well-rounded shooting medic. Close to, if I had a reference, it would be a, a, a PJ, okay. right? Just a good shooting, well-rounded medic. We're two hours from definitive care, almost everywhere you go. So you need a medic with boots on who could, do, who, who, who could also do airways if needed, right? Like we had to be able to sustain someone in kind of, any kind of trauma, traumatic event before we can get them on a bird or have to drive the whole fucking way there, right? So these, these Borstar dudes have evolved into this really well-rounded shooting medic. Um, and then we started really tying in the tactical medicine with, with uh, Bortec. So for a while, when I first got in there, medics were sitting in the truck while Bortec was doing the mission. And I'm like, yo dog, I am not that dude. I do not want to sit in a truck, put me on the team or get me out of here. And so when I got my, my when I passed the selection, which we did down by Buzz, and as these fucking dudes are getting smoked, our cadre is making us do the same thing. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? We're chained up and wasting us. I'm like, oh God, dude. They're looking at the beach like, oh, that's a great That's idea. exactly what they were doing, bro. I swear to God, I was like, could we have done it anywhere else, bro? Yeah, so it was a, it was a tough selection. I had highly respected it, but then yeah, now I'm now I'm operational, and I told them right away, I was like I want to be a I want to be a tech med dude, and I want to attach a board tech. 
Um, and so I'm attached with Bortec. And they knew my background. Like, we had a little bit of a tiff before. You know, that little bit of a, a shit talk shit. Like, oh, I don't want the medic on the X. I'm like, bitch, who has more combat experience than me? Nobody. Shut up. You know yeah. what I mean? It was this really weird ego kind of thing. And when the hydraulic fluid starts leaking, you want the fucking mechanic on the Ready 5. <laughs> yeah, but I think there was so much ego at the time with Bortac and and a lot of those guys didn't have combat experience. A lot of guys weren't military dudes, so they, they, they were raised to believe this was the right way. Yeah. And I think as we started to have more combat experienced dudes, it made only sense like, no, dude, we need the medic. And so now you have this really solid fighting force of boar tackers with dope tack medics who are specific to that field. And um, you know, I was one of the first dudes to be able to do that and integrate that successfully. There's a few of us, but I was one of the first ones of that. And then eventually, you know, I, um, I got lateral transfer to SOG, which is our, you know, I, I, I don't want to use the word tier one, but they're the they're higher end. Makes sense. They're, yeah. the na they're the national team that could get activated anywhere in the world if needed, because we do conflicts all over. You know, we've had objectives in Africa. We've had it all, right? And so we were the, the primary, like, tier one element of the Department of Homeland Security Border Patrol. And, and dude, it was... It was a it was a really cool time, and we got to do a lot of cool missions and and really try and do our duty to disrupt and 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 as well as when we were not disrupting anything, we're out there stopping traffic. You know, we're actually doing the job. And so, um, yeah, the special operations units of the border patrol is something that most people don't know of, um, and I believe they do now from that active shooter situation down in Uvalde. Yeah. Uvalde, man, yeah. How much legitimacy do you put into, again, it's, it's almost like any conversation around the border has to be framed yeah. left or right, which are, I fucking hate those terms. I know. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about like this exigent threat of people crossing the border. I'm going to assume they mean illegally with malicious intent. It's, it largely it comes back into the terrorism bubble. Yeah. How much legitimacy do you put into that in your own experience on working in, in the border? Well, during my time, I know for a fact um, I've been a part of sectors that have apprehended people on the terrorist watch list. So that alone says it. Yes, personally, I've seen it, hands down. And that's one sector and one group that we did get compared to every other sector across America that you miss. A gotaway is not a fucking uncommon term. You're like, yo, got five gotaways right here. You see their footprints all the way to the street. You know, obviously, they loaded up. We missed them. That is not uncommon. That's a daily thing. This isn't like we're stopping everybody. We're absolutely not. We're stopping a percentage, but not all of them. And to think that just when we did apprehend some, there was someone on the FBI wanted list. There's a terrorist watch list. There's, there's, there is child molesters. There is rapists. There is murderers. Like, we're catching all of that. We're also catching people from, like, Afghanistan, Iraq, whether they're good or bad, right? Some could be, like, Terps that, that were part of us overseas, but now they're getting away from that. You know what I mean? Like, doesn't matter. We are stopping that, you know? And then we're, there's a lot we're not. There's a concern, you know what I mean? Especially if you come from our background. I, I can't be naive to say there's not a concern. There's always a concern. Um, I think there's, I think there's, if, I mean, I don't want to put numbers on it, but if I had to, it'd be like 80, 20, 80% 80 of people are coming across because they just want to get to America and, and live this, 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 you know, this fruitful lifestyle that we have here. And then there's a good 20% that are like, dude, I have to come over illegal because no way I'm going to get here any other way. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that's just the, the, it's the obvious truth of it, man. You know what I mean? And we, there's too many people that don't want to see both sides of immigration and homeless security. They just want to see one or the other. Right. If you look at only Homeland Security, then you're, you're factoring out the truth of what America is based off of in immigration. And if you're only thinking about immigration, you're leaving out the truth that there could be potential threats. And so we have to look at it in, in two parts. You have a house. You have a door on your house. When people come to your house, you expect them to knock on that door. And then you have a determination whether you're going to let them in or out. We should have the same freedoms. Yeah, I agree. And then you got to add into that the narcotic trade. <laughs> <laughs> Narcotics are crazy, dude. Is it, is it even solvable? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I think... I mean, some of the numbers that they throw out, I think I just saw a report where it was like... I want to say billion, but that number is, seems insane. Like, two million fentanyl pills. Like, enough to fucking kill everybody, everybody and everything. Yeah, no, absolutely. I don't think you're... But then, then I, I read that, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you caught two million. Full disclosure, I've never been a drug smuggler. So right. I throw this out here. <laughs> but if I was to think like that, I would go with... The war of attrition. Yes. I'm going to send so much 
that I don't care if you caught my two million because the eight other million mm -hmm. made it through. I believe that's exactly what's happening. I believe wholeheartedly, as much as we catch, they get enough cross, there is no issue. The cat and mouse game of, I'm still getting this cross, no stress. I believe if we try and, if we are stopping so much that it causes a ripple effect to the cartel, we're gonna feel that too, in a sense. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. If you're fucking with their money, they'll find a way to figure that out. I, I believe that, but they also, the way things have worked on the border, it's almost like this um, comfort, comfortable space of, we get enough cross, we catch enough, everyone, everyone's happy. It's a victory for both sides. Right, exactly. And so think about like, so there's been incidents where, where a border patrol agent was killed on the border from a drug smuggler. I don't believe the intent was ever to do that. It's just one outstanding incident where the, the knucklehead made a bad choice and killed a border patrol agent. What happens is we, soup up the security. So now so you say it's actually not to their benefit to kill a border Absolutely. patrol Absolutely. Yeah, so it becomes three, three times the security now on that whole border while we investigate this whole thing and try and figure this out. Because now there's a threat, right? Well, then now that stops all traffic for them because now they can't get it across because everywhere you look, we're covering. That's not good for them. What about the same question applied to illegal border crossings versus legal border crossings? And, and the volume of people that you were seeing, I'm going to make an assumption that you probably saw a lot of repeat customers, yes. people trying and trying again. And I, would, I, would, I want to believe as a person that those people who are continuously trying both A, are coming across because they believe in what they can accomplish in their life or achieve yeah. in their life in the United States. And B, are not, they don't have, you know, there's something that they're running away from or trying yeah. to flee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but is it possible for us to have a system that maybe even could drastically reduce the number of people that are making that risk and coming across illegally through our ports of entry? I, I do. You know, you know, if they come through a port of entry, that's the right way. You know what I mean? We don't have that enough. But why? Well, look at immigration, how long it takes for someone to become a legal immigrant the right way. It takes sometimes 12, 14 years. That's, that's a process that not everyone's willing to manage, right? Who would want to fight? I'd say most. Right, most. So if we're gonna try and fix this, we have to fix our immigration policies and how we streamline that process. How do we streamline that process? I don't know, right? But I don't know why 14 years is the number, 12 years is the number they chose. Um, and that's a challenge. If they got a DUI during that time, you're done, back, right? So, and there's policies in place that if you come over illegally once, then you can't come back for another five years. So if I was gonna try and fix this, I would say the one thing we can do is educate more. So it's not, a lot of people say Mexicans coming across illegally. It's a very small amount of Mexicans actually coming across. It's the called other than Mexicans. OTMs is the label that's given by cartel and by us, right? We just, that's how we label it. Other than Mexicans is everyone south of Mexico or Africa, China, right? Like all these other countries. So that's the majority of people, Honduras, uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, El Salvador, uh, Chile, all those are what's coming across in like massive amounts, you know what I mean? And that's because, you know, their livelihood is at stake, right? Their livelihood, they're not making the money they want. Yeah, I can't, I can't fault people for trying to better their life. I wish that we could have more open and honest conversations yeah. about immigration without immediately veering off to the left and the right. Yeah. Because as soon as you do that shit, it's over. Yeah, it, it ruins, it ruins fair communication and, and, and good debate. You know, I really think we should be, we should be educating countries on how to become, Im, how, to, how to immigrate to America legally. We need to be advocates for showing the right path. Here's how you do it. Here's how they tell you to do it, but also remember who they are. They're trying to manipulate, You're, it's a business to them, right? They're not a travel agency. They're, they're, they're a human trafficking organization. So they're making their money, whether you make it or not, to your destination. And that's the sad truth. You are nothing but a number for them. Now, if you do it this way, it may take longer, but this is how you do it legally. We need to, we need to educate. Hands down, that should be a big part of what we do, is educate. You want to come to America? We got you. This is what we do. But you got to do it this way. Now, we also got to streamline that process. Dude, it can't take 12 years for someone who's genuinely here working their fucking ass that's off. That's psychotic. Dude. That's crazy, yeah. right? So that's fucking completely absurd. So what do you, what do you, you tell me it take 12 years? Like, nah, bro, I can do that same thing <laughs> going through Eagle Pass, Texas, dog. You know what I mean? So that's what we have here, right? We have these layers of immigration that are not being addressed, right? The surface level is being changed for every, every political party that comes in party. It comes in surface level changes that makes everyone feel nice, warm, and fuzzy. But the truth is the deep-rooted immigration policies haven't been changed in many, many years. 
And that is what we've continued to create this, this, this path. And since human trafficking in itself, like human trafficking smuggling has become a new business, well then now, again, it, it becomes so lucrative that they're gonna continue to manipulate people in, 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 until we stop that, which is incredibly hard to do. What was the hardest thing you had to deal with in your time at Border Control? You know, when I was a border agent, you know, you, you can walk up on a dead body, right? In the summers in Texas, it can get up to like 118 degrees sometimes. They're walking sometimes seven hours to seven days, depending on different parts of ranches and locations. And so it's not uncommon for a group to get scattered, uh, get lost. The, 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 the scout or the coyote is what they call them, goes back to Mexico and leaves them all fending for themselves. And they scattered at night because the border agent rolled close to them. And then during the day, they're trying to find their way to some kind of sanctuary and they, they, they end up falling and dying because of dehydration. Not uncommon. I'm talking 30 to 60 times a fucking summer. You'll find that. That's, that's a lot. That's insane. And then there's people that come across, a, a lot of uh, the illegal immigrants coming across that I've had experience with don't swim well. And so that's a risk every time. You have to fucking have a heart for that dog. They want this so bad, they're willing to risk everything for it. I feel for that. I feel for that in a very profound level of like, God, I won the lottery ticket being born here, and they didn't. And I'm not mad at them making that ch choice, but I am mad when they've put themselves in harm's way and risked everything for it. It bothers me, dude, because I don't want that for anyone, dog. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want anyone, I don't want anyone dying trying to risk themselves to, to become an American citizen. But it happens daily, dude, and it's fucked up, dude. It's hard to watch and hard to know. And, um, and so I have compassion. I have, I have a lot of empathy for, for how much people are willing to risk coming here. And you gotta appreciate this country that much more. Imagine what it would take standing at the edge of a body of water and you know you can't fucking swim. Yeah. Imagine how much value or how much belief that you would have to have on what is on the other side of that body of water to risk it. Yes, exactly. And I believe, I personally believe that that is what our country still is. I think I, we are still absolutely. worth that and I wish more people would take the time to think about it from that perspective. Put yourself in somebody's shoes in that situation. What would it take for you in your own life using this pond that nobody would ever be able to see <laughs> since, yeah. you know, but to, and let's say it's, there are probably sections that are that far, but what in your life do you want enough that you're willing to literally put it all on the line and try to get across this knowing you can't fucking swim? Bro. I don't think most people ever are faced with something like that. No. Or even if they are, I don't think most of them would get their feet wet. It's, Dude, it is. It's fucking hard to watch, man. You know, my buddy told me a story that I, I had nightmares on, dude. He works on the boat crew and a mom can't swim. She's up to her chest in water and throws her fucking baby at him. And he fucking catches the baby. And he's like, what the fuck? He's yelling at her in Spanish, like, what the fuck is wrong with you crazy? What the fuck? And she said, you don't know my life. And he's like, fuck. No, it's not my place to question. It's none of our place to question why people do that, dog. None of ours. Border agent does his job. You apprehend him, process him, whatever the immigration policy at the time is what happens. And we, we can't do nothing other than have empathy and have gratitude for the fact that we have this opportunity. And these people are dying for it, dude. They're fucking dying. They're risking everything for it. Just to have their kid have an opportunity like us. But we have something special here, man. That's why we have this issue. We have something special here. That's why everyone's fucking dying to come here. There's beautiful value in America. And if you use it right, if you do it right, it's gorgeous and your whole family gets to eat and they get to live a very, very fruitful life compared to what they would have had. How do we tell that story without it getting lost in politics? Because I feel like that's the big, it's like, you. You start trying to say that, and then it becomes hijacked and thrown into it. That's the problem, man. Like, 
I'm scared as fuck of just being saying this conversation and what someone else is gonna pull from it, right? They're gonna take a small snippet of this conversation and turn it into like this most, who knows, racist or whatever it is, and all of a sudden they demonize me for being a guy just speaking the truth, right? Like that's the saddest thing we have in America right now is that people take snippets of conversations and turn it into a narrative that is completely false and to destroy people for that. And all I'm saying is like, dude, we have a beautiful country and people are dying to get here. That makes me value more of what I have. And two, it makes me empathetic for those who are trying and how can we fix that situation? That's it, you know? And how can we not demonize someone who's doing their job to try and protect the country from potential threats? It's the most like, dynamic argument you can find that everyone will have a different viewpoint and everyone can find a reason to hate it, love it, whatever the case. And there's just the, it, it's, it's impossible to tell this in a way where everyone's gonna be happy. You live out in Utah, I live in Montana. The odds of you and I having a national level change, mm -hmm. I mean, if it's you and I, <laughs> it's still zero, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, but what I can do is I can get deeply involved where I actually live. Yes. And that is the theory that I think is the only one that actually has traction. And, and that's the, the, the stumbling point that I find for a lot of people is they get wrapped up in the national argument and they forget that they have an actual large amount of impact they can have at a local level. Absolutely. I don't know how that necessarily applies to immigration, but I just, that when people feel overwhelmed and powerless, I feel like it ends up, they just sit there and they're just, again, on that anxiety cube, yeah. just scrolling away. Well, believing everything that they see. You know, it does help with immigration, right? It does, we do have policies that are specific to Texas. We do have policies that are specific to California. And so if you want changes in those, we have to be a fighting force for that, right? You have to fight that. Um, it's a, all of this stuff is, is, is such a, these are all hard conversations, you know what I mean? And I don't think we have it enough. You know, I hope people watch this and actually learn something of the viewpoint that I'm coming from, and not that I'm coming from any other angle of like, here's my experience and what I believe because I'm not here to fight no one on this topic. I want this to be fixed, you know what I mean? I want us to have a safe country and a, and a country that allows immigrants to come in here and be, have, be fruitful and be, be successful. That's what I want, I want both. I'm a, I'm a fan for both of those to happen, you know what I mean? And whatever gets us to that point, I'm all in. But as it stands now, they're both in, in, a, in a very bad place and I don't know how we can turn back from that now. I think at best you'll get 90% at both. I don't think 100% of both is possible. Right. Probably just based off of the way that they interface with each other or the systems. But yeah, I think we could do better on I, both. I agree. For sure. How can people support the Border Patrol? I, th I think as they, as they read up on it and they learn about it, they understand it, um, we stop using them as the focal point of the, the p political fight, left or right, I don't care, just stop using them. They use their image, they use their likeness. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I think, we need support on the border in the sense of like, right now there's such a lack of border patrol agents in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the border because people are so afraid of the job now. They're actually having, uh, you know, they're having issues with keeping border patrol agents on the job because of all the, the shit that came down on them that had nothing to do with them. And so like what I would, I would say, if you're in the military and you're getting out soon, you're looking for a career field that pays well and is freaking, I said, it is a beautiful career field, Border Patrol. If you're a former- Does it tie into the federal uh, pension system as well? Does military you can buy, time You can roll? buy into it, yes. Okay, cool. You can buy into it. So there's a chance to not lose your time if you didn't do a full time? Yeah. Absolutely, you buy into it, you have to pay a certain amount of money based on how many years, yeah. boom. You know, uh, it is hands down, if you're special operations, you're looking for to kind of continue to do that, but in your own country, somewhere you're home more often, special operations of the Border Patrol. The best kept secret in the fucking nation. We get paid well. Right, we're one of the top, top paying federal jobs in the nation. Again, I mean, you can compete with FBI pay. You know, it's a good career field and I believe it is one of the most American jobs you can have that I really, really wholeheartedly feel is doing right by even illegal immigrants. That's what I believe. Why'd you decide to leave? <clears throat> um, I was on the top team of the Border Patrol. We were, I was the medic for Bortec, and we had the opportunity to go help, tra uh, to go help um, track down uh, 
the two escaped convicts, convicts in New York, Matt and Sweat, in 2015. They, 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 in 2015, they escaped prison. They had a relationship with one of the corrections officers. They convinced her. They escaped the prison, and we went on a manhunt. And so during that manhunt, we went about seven days, and no luck. We came up on a lot of dry holes. Essentially, the intel was good, but we were too late. So my daughter's birthday, we talked about this before we even started filming, is like how much I've missed and how much we've missed in our kids' lives. And I was really trying to be a more present father, right? As I'm on that path of trying to figure that out, um, my daughter's birthday was coming up and we were doing this luau. And um, you know, I already ordered the jump and bounce. I ordered the, 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 the little Hawaiian skirt and all that for all of us. And, and um, I just got back from training with other three letter agencies my stuff was still packed and I get the call like, yo, they're activating us to go. I was like, oh shit, man, it's been a few days. I'm surprised it took so long, you know? Packed up and we jumped over there. So as these seven days pass of no traffic, we're missing, you know, we're doing boat ops, we're doing air assault ops, we're doing all these things. We're, 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 we're hiking into locations where we heard they're at. Um, we ended up coming into a dry hole and I believe it was like a Friday. Um, they said, hey, we're gonna take the weekend off and if we get no word by Sunday of new intel, we're redeploying on Monday. So I, my daughter's birthday was on that Saturday. I said, A, I told my supervisor, I said, do you mind if I fly home a day early? I had this birthday plan for my daughter and I would love to be there. Um, we went out and did karaoke that night. And then the morning I flew home. And as I'm home, cutting up some of the vegetables, and I get emotional about this, man, because it's, it it's always been a hard decision for me. Um, I saw in the news that a Border Patrol, uh, Border Patrol Special Operations uh, has captured one of the men and they engaged on him and shot and killed him. And at the same time, I used to be the kind of the, the officer that they called in case of any kind of traumatic events. I was part of a trained group that um, that would be a kind of response team for that stuff. And so I got a call from him for two parts. One, to tell me that he's been in an engagement. And then two, that it was him. And I'm like, fuck. Being the medic for a special operations team, being completely committed to these dudes and then taking the day off and then them getting into an engagement. It ate me alive, dude. It ate me alive. It ate me alive because, like I said earlier, I believed in, in, in the fight uh, to die for anything. And the same when the Border Patrol, I believed in that. I'll die for anyone on my team, left and right. Don't care what the policies, I don't care nothing. Those dudes were who I was supposed to cover. Those dudes is who I was supposed to be the medic for. And those dudes are the dudes I, uh, I turned my back on thinking family was more important. And uh, I left them hanging in a moment they needed me, or I felt they did. And uh, it fucking bothers me still to this day, dude, that similar to my last deployment in, in, in Range Battalion, I was kind of half-assed medic for these dudes, you know what I'm saying? And when I walked away to pick family first, I didn't think it would Never in a million years, dude, did I think it would be at the sacrifice of them getting into engagement. Just never thought it would happen, man. And so I resigned two weeks later. How does that sit with you today? It's the right choice. Hands down, right choice. Hands down. Um, my family's so cool, man. And my fucking, that same daughter this year was a three-time state champ wrestler. Like. Dude, she's bad. I, like, the family's cool, man, and my kids are great, and they have, I was there, I carried her, you know what I mean? Like, I've been there. But if I didn't make that choice then, dude, I don't think I ever would have made that choice. And I would have continued to live that kind of lifestyle, dude, and continue to miss everything important to them, and continue to just pay the bills, and never be a relevant father in their life. <laughs> And that was a big pivoting moment in my life. And I don't think everyone gets that opportunity. I don't think everyone has that insight or, or that perspective at the time. So I was very fortunate that a lot of things were happening in my life for me to make that choice when I did. Um, and I, I don't regret it in the sense of I've been able to be a part of a lot of special things in my kids' lives. I would have regretted to continue to be a half ass medic for a team that needed me. You still believe in what this country stands for? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've, I've never turned my back on that thought. Um, 
it's a hard time right now, dude. It's a hard time to look at the, everything that's going on and be like, damn, I'm proud. I'm proud, man. I still pay my bills. I still believe in the heart and soul of it. And, and like I said earlier from illegal immigration, how much people want to come here, you have to believe in what we have here. Have to. All right, everybody. Hopefully you found that interview to be interesting and it piqued your interest into what is actually going on at our borders, both southern and northern. If you want to learn a little bit more about the work that the Border Patrol does, I recommend you go directly to their website. Again, you could also read or pick up Rocco's book, which is called Borderline, Defending the Home Front, which is going to release this fall. And like we mentioned in the interview, one of the most effective ways to enact change on the issue is to vote, both on a federal level and at the local election level. And that's it for this week. See you guys next week.